Hey folks, you know I have an interest in computers, not only like the ones you see here, the successful ones, but also the non-successful ones. And this week we're going to be talking about the one with the shortest life of four months, the Mattel Aquarius. So we're going to take a quick deep dive and find out exactly why this computer never had a chance. The story actually starts back in 1979, when Mattel released the Intellivision game console. It started development in 1977, the same year as its competitor, the Atari 2600. It was introduced in 1979 at the Las Vegas CES Expo as a modular component, priced at $165, with a keyboard component with cassette and several extra functions soon to follow. But the keyboard component was an ambitious piece of engineering, and it was repeatedly delayed trying to reduce its cost. The delays caused so many complaints from customers who bought the console in anticipation of the coming keyboard that the FTC got involved. Once they started an investigation for fraud, they started to charge them $10,000 a month fine to either put up or shut up. So the keyboard was canceled in August of 82. Now Mattel contracted Radofin, the company that manufactured the Intellivision, to produce two computers, and they were going to call them the Mattel Aquarius and Aquarius II. It was announced in 1982 and released in June of 83 at a price of $160, but it had problems right out of the gate. 4K of memory with only 1.7K available on startup, the lousy chiclet-style keyboard with no space bar and just a space button to the left and not a full version of BASIC without even four next commands. They had expansion items including cassette storage, a mini expander with two control pads, 16K of memory, and a printer which was actually rebadged from use for the Intellivision. But they made the mistake of selling it under cost, hoping customers would buy the add-ons to make it actually useful. But the thing is, you've got to have something that's actually desirable about it in the first place something that makes you want to add on the extra item and they just didn't have it. It was supposed to be an entry-level system and it was for 1980. You see the Commodore VIC-20 and the Radio Shack color computers were both released in 1980 at 299 399 respectively and their base system also came with 4K but that was in 1980. This is 1983 and right now we're in the middle of the home computer pricing war. Commodore was in a heavy price war with Texas Instruments TI-994A. They kept dropping the price of the VIC-20 below $100, forcing Texas Instrument to do the same. And the Color Computer 2 had just come out, with a much better keyboard, 16K of memory, much better graphics, and a price of only $159. Simply put, the Aquarius had no chance. Mattel, hoping to sell 100,000 units in the first quarter, only sold 20,000. They immediately stopped production, sold the rights back to Radofin, and ended the short life of the Mattel Aquarius. Okay folks, now it's time to actually take a look at the device ourselves. Now this is one I just got. It's brand new in the box, even though the box has seen better days. But everything was still in bags on the inside, all the cables still wound up. So somebody must have took it out, looked at it for five minutes, put it back in the box, and set it in the closet for 40 years, which is good for me. But notice on here, even though all you get is the home computer itself, it has inside six games on a cassette. See, I told you, they're already trying to push additional things to purchase, which, of course, the first thing you would need would be a cassette. On the back, and what's funny to me, it's showing extra devices. You know, the expansion device that comes with the two paddles, the printer. It's not showing the cassette. You know, the thing they gave you a, a brand new cassette for? <sighs> oh, well. Now, like I said on the history info, there's no space bar, which is a pain in the butt. You got a space button over here. It's got the horrible chiclet keyboard. The power cable is made onto it. It does not unplug got a standard wall transformer around the side you've got a power switch on the back you've got what looks to be an audio jack but that's actually for the printer you've got a five pin din for the cassette a switch for channel three or four and RF output to the TV 
And that's about it. Well, you've also, here's your expansion port where you could put on an expansion box that gives you an extra port or to plug in games. So, you're going to see some 80s goodness here because, of course, since we're using RF, you've got the box, the push on Balin that always falls off, and here's the jack to the back of the, let me get that out of the way, it's kind of loose, a jack for the RF outputs. Plug that in there, down all the way. Let me take this to the back of the TV. Put the Balin on, it's hanging on for dear life. Boy, those things are awful. And let's see if we get a screen. Okay, let's see what we see. That's what you get with a, a push on. Yeah, this is the way it was in the old days, folks. Relish it. There we go. Finally got a nice clean. That's a good clean screen. Microsoft. Microsoft's been around so much longer than you think. Well, there is two things that were missing from the box. The instruction booklet and the cassette that they're advertising on the front. So, I got the cassette player. It's a, it's a touch more use, colors a little browner, but what's cool is inside was the cassette I'm missing. So hey, we can connect things up and take a look at one of their games. Now one thing also you need to mention that would have been a something to sigh at back then. It connects with the same five pin DIN type cable that were around everywhere, especially for Tandy Radio Shack computers for cassette players. But even though it's exactly the same, it's not wired the same on the inside. So you couldn't hook a Tandy one up. You had to get theirs or it just wouldn't work right. One good thing is at least they label these since they're identical in appearance. This one says ear. And this one would be the microphone. They have a jack for remote, but there's no remote on the cable. Well, I was going to try to load one of the games on the cassettes, but none of them would load. And so I took a look at the tape and, hey, if that doesn't bring back some nostalgia, the whole tape is like this. Remember those days? Even with audio tapes? Well, it was just as good with data tapes. So... All I could do was I found a couple of small programs that were on the online manuals. So here's the little program. It doesn't do a lot. It is that. It's pretty darn slow, isn't it? And boy, the bleed over is just awful. Look at that. So that's what that looks like. Boy, that is one blurry screen, but boy, we used to have to deal with that stuff back in the early 80s. We didn't have component hookup. This was RF hookup only, channel three or four, and that's what you got. Welcome, welcome to the 80s. Well, we'll try one more. I'll put in a little one here. This is supposed to be concentric circles, I guess, if you closed one eye. It looks like concentric dots to me, but it functions. I guess that's what it did. This goes to show you how bad the graphics were on here. I mean, it was nothing compared to the Commodore 64 or the Atari or the color computer, anything of the time that was pretty close to the same price. So, well, you got to see how it worked. And uh, I guess we'll see you next time. <laughs>